Uh, well, when I was uh, invited to give this talk, uh, I think the hope was that I would shed light on the exhibition that Roger and I curated. So it may seem odd that uh, I'm going to dis what I'm going to discuss is virtually uh, absent. It's invisible uh, in the authors on display. Um, the title of the exhibition, as you've just heard, is Shakespeare's Contemporaries and Elizabethan culture, but about 50% of the people who constituted Shakespeare's contemporaries are absent from the list of authors and scientists and, and artists in the vestibule. Um, and that's because as far as we could discern, Special Collections has no female authored texts uh, from Shakespeare's lifetime. So to shed light on what we see in the exhibition, it seemed useful to shed light on what we don't see and why that is. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, a little less than, uh, about female characters in Shakespeare's plays than about the social and historical conditions in which he created them. Uh, but first a few words about the global Shakespeare industry. Um, <laughs> given, given that annually uh, the world consumes countless professional and amateur performances of Shakespeare, film adaptations, books, essays, action figures, clothing articles, radio shows, blogs, bumper stickers, apps, Shakespearean toast, uh, cigars, and barista customized lattes, it's, it's safe to say that 400 years after his death, Shakespeare is extraordinarily alive. Uh, and I think there are many reasons uh, for the immediacy and even the radical modernity of his plays. Uh, among those reasons are of course, the psychological depth and the intellectual and emotional range of his characters. But another reason I think Shakespeare continues to resonate with modern audiences is his remarkably insightful investigation of social change and cultural fault lines. Uh, as is the case in the 21st century, the early modern period was a time of tremendous change and instability social, economic, religious, political, scientific, cultural instability. Uh, in England, for example, <clears throat> official versions of truth, of, of God's immutable judgment regarding good and bad and right and wrong, shifted as often as a new monarch ascended to the throne. Um, so now I'm going to sprint through some of the, the different political versions of God's unchanging truth. Um, starting in the 1530s, the, the English God's truth was that Catholics no longer belong to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and then in 1553, it's Protestants who don't know the truth. Uh, but five years later, the Protestant Elizabeth wrested back both truth and power, which were clearly synonymous. Uh, and in 1570, Pope Pius V excommunicated Elizabeth and threatened eternal damnation uh, for any Catholic who obeyed her. And amidst, uh, interestingly, amidst all this moral and political inconsistency, there was one constant. Jews had been relentlessly excluded from any English version of God's truth since 1290, when Edward I expelled them, and they weren't legally allowed to return to England until 1657, when uh, Oliver Cromwell was in power. I'm going to be awash. I've got three bottles. Thank you. Uh, uh, and so the, the wars of truth uh, continued grinding on long after uh, uh, Shakespeare's death. But it wasn't just legal and religious truths that were unstable. Traditional structures and institutions, such as class hierarchy and marriage, were destabilized as an emerging mercantile class began to acquire more status uh, uh, and through greater wealth and through marrying into the aristocracy. And so as merchants could afford more lavish lifestyles, it became increasingly difficult to distinguish a mere common-born person from an aristocrat, from someone whose privilege and wealth and status were inherited and thus defined by blood. So in other words, a person's outside, her clothes, ornaments, home, or retinue, uh, was no longer necessarily commensurate with or indicative of the color of her blood on the inside. So the plumage of privilege obscured rather than signified or verified one's place in the traditional political hierarchy. And this, this led to, this fascinating stuff, it, it led to legislation uh, called sumptuary laws 
that governed very specifically what cloth, jewelry, feathers, and even shoe leather people could wear as determined by their title or, or by the amount of property that they held. And in addition to all this spinning planet of change, um, during Shakespeare's lifetime, as you know, there was a fluorescence of uh, discoveries, of geographic exploration and technological inventions in astronomy and medicine, physics, uh, navigation. So received uh, scientific methods of generating and ordering knowledge were also dislocated. And, and all of these changes, and, and many more, uh, caused tremendous anxiety amid cultures that were constantly having the, uh, the, the, the rug of truth and familiarity pulled out from underneath them. So it isn't surprising that the disruptions and anxieties of the period had significant effects on, among other things, representations and roles of women. In, in the literature of the period, fear of the unknown was often displaced onto the body of the woman, which was treated as a kind of locus of incommensurateness or difference between interior and exterior. So their bodies came to signify this really disturbing disparity between what misleadingly appears to be true and what is true. Uh, between what we think we know and, 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 uh, and what's actually hidden from our knowledge. The, the disparity between what's on the outside and what's on the inside. Uh, another way to put that is uh, that women became the sign of epistemological disorder. So the sinful soul in a beguiling woman's body became an emblem of all the deceiving confusion in the period. A popular icon was a statue of Frau Welt, or Lady World, which depicted a beautiful woman uh, from the front. But when you walked around behind the statue, you saw a decomposing skeleton that was crawling with snakes and toads and vermin. And this was actually more than just a memento mori. Uh, the icon of uh, Frau Welt figures the kind of deadly space behind the artifice of woman. Uh, the, the morally repugnant interiority uh, that can't be seen. Uh, and and uh, so similarly, the author of I Invite of Inwit denounces women's uh, deceitful exterior. He says, her fair body is no more than a white sack full of stinking dung, like a <laughs> dunghill covered with snow. Uh, so, uh, so the feminine was a kind of scapegoat of, uh, of cultural disorder and uncertainty and was perceived as a threat that, that had to be controlled and silenced and, and destroyed or married, uh, which, in the <laughs> <laughs> which in the period effectively meant controlling and, and silencing the female. Here, of course, we have um, Elizabeth Taylor as Kate uh, in The Taming of the Shrew. In Shakespeare's England, uh, a woman's legal identity depended on her relationship to men. That is, she was defined by whom she belonged to as a daughter or sister or wife, because women were legally designated as the property of male guardians. According to English common law, married women were quiliter mortis, that is, uh, civilly dead, and, and covered by the legal personhood of their husbands. In his uh, commentaries on the laws of England, Sir William Blackstone explained this. By marriage, uh, well, uh, he explained that. Why is my, well, um, you can read that and I'll read this. Uh, <laughs> by marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection, and cover she performs everything. So in other words, under the logic of coverture, wives had no legal autonomy. Shakespeare's Portia, whose dead father's will dictates the terms of her marriage, invokes this principle when, when she says to her betrothed, my gentle spirit commits itself to yours to be directed as from her lord, her governor, her king. 
myself and what is mine to you and yours is now converted. This house, these servants, and this same myself are yours, my Lord. One of the ironies of this speech is that Portia is by leagues the smartest and least submissive character in The Merchant of Venice. Her control of everything that happens in the play is second only to the playwrights. Um, but of course, uh, she has to masquerade as a male in order to direct uh, much of the action. But as we watch the commanding presence of this young girl as she puts on lawyer's robes, it's almost impossible to ignore the implication that gender is performative rather than essential, that it's just a matter of costuming. You put on a lawyer's robes and you, know, you win the case. Um, and, that, and that authority or entitlement um, is conferred by culture rather than by nature or God. Um, and this is wildly subversive stuff uh, uh, in, in, um, uh, in a period in which you know, the courts accorded females the same legal status as children, imbeciles, and peasants. <laughs> and even though Shakespeare recuperates the party line by the end of the play when he restores Portia and, and all the other unruly women to marital confinement, um, I think the ideological horse is out of the barn uh, by that point. All of Shakespeare's uh, cross-dressed comic heroines call into question not only the charade of identity, uh, but also the compulsive heterosexuality that tidies up the confusion caused by these erotically flexible characters uh, in, in his comedies. In As You Like It, for example, uh, a boy actor played Rosalind, as was the case for all of the female roles during Shakespeare's uh, lifetime. Uh, so the boy actor, dressed as a girl, decides in the story of the play uh, to disguise herself as a boy and escape to the forest of Arden, where he pretends to be a girl courted by Orlando. And this is vertiginous. Uh, uh, and, and what happens, as Thomas Pynchon would say, is that erotic attraction jumps the fence and heads for the ridge line. Um, <laughs> girls fall in love with girls, boys with boys, girls with boys, boys with girls. The play seems to work against categorizing uh, sexuality, uh, against fixing on one mode of desire until the end, uh, when Rosalind divests herself of her freedom and gives herself to uh, a father who then gives her to a husband. But um, it seems to me that by, by that point, her erotic mobility has achieved escape velocity. And, uh, and it actually does carry her out of the frame of the play into the epilogue. Uh, and and uh, so remember, the story has ended now. But, but now, a boy actor wearing a wedding dress flirts directly with the audience. So just as you know, when the comic conventions require that women be anchored and essentialized and married, the author kind of reiterates um, the, uh, this, this implication about the constructedness of gender and the, the flexibility of erotic attraction. It's, it's really remarkable to me what, what Shakespeare got past the government censor uh, at a time <laughs> when the state was just tightening its grip on women's mobility and speech and, and desire. But why did, uh, the, why did the regulation of females reach such a rancorous pitch in the, in the early modern period? I think to a significant extent, uh, the restrictions were grounded in economic imperatives. Um, in England, the transmission of land and money and other property was governed by a, syst a system of primogeniture in which the oldest legitimate son uh, inherited the bulk of the family's capital. It, so needless to say, with wealth and status at stake, it was necessary that paternity be clearly established, because otherwise the family's consolidated capital would pass out of the bloodlines to an outside male's lineage. So women's sexuality was strictly controlled in order to regulate the inheritance of property. Um, and, and as you know, a number of Shakespeare's plays dramatize the fact that an unmarried girl's virginity was her father's property, and a husband owned his wife's body. 
uh, Hermia, uh, Hermia's father in A Midsummer Night's Dream uh, invokes the ancient privilege of Athens. This is the last quote here of dispossessed uh, fathers. Um, he invokes the uh, ancient pr privilege of Athens. As she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to this gentleman or to her death, according to the law. And then the Duke uh, confirms this kind of paternal prerogative over Hermia's life and death. He says to her, be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, yea, and one to whom you are but as a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. Juliet's father uh, echoes Theseus's warning about the patriarch's disfiguring power. Uh, he, Capulet, Capulet threatens her with starvation and homelessness and death if she refuses to marry the husband that, that he has selected for her. He says to her, uh, and, and in many uh, um, performances of, of this play, the, the director, the actors, decide to make this a very, very violent scene, which I think is right. Uh, uh, yeah, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet has, has the fathers throwing Juliet around the bedroom as he's saying these lines. Uh, and you be mine, I'll give you to my friend. And you be not, hang, beg, starve, die in the streets, for by my soul I'll ne'er acknowledge thee, nor what is mine shall never do thee good. So clearly, women's sexuality was a valuable commodity uh, in, in the marriage market, one that might be bought and sold um, in arranged marriages so, to, so as to perpetuate family names and uh, form political alliances and consolidate or augment wealth. Um, anthropologists has, have observed that this gift uh, of women transacted between men is the basis uh, of many more cultures than just early modern England, but that it's a kind of a primary, originary basis of culture itself, that the relationship established in the exchange of, of women is not just one of reciprocity, but, but of, of kinship and of civil order. And of course, Queen Elizabeth brilliantly deployed her own exchange value and kind of indefinitely deferred disbursing it, um, while the less powerful Juliet uh, has to die for presuming jurisdiction over her desire. Um, and in that play, of course, property and power and kinship are all centered on Juliet's body. Uh, as was the case in Elizabethan courts, Romeo's um, elopement with her is considered a crime of property against her father. And so, economic ownership and authority were, were at stake in the early modern regulation of, of female sexuality. And as a result, all forms of female self-assertion, not just sexual desire, but speaking and writing, um, were considered disruptive and even monstrous. Uh, the ideal woman, of course, was chaste, silent, and obedient. Uh, she was taught to cultivate the, the virtues of passivity and, and modesty. In fact, two popular emblems for the period, uh, are, uh, uh, for the female, that sort of uh, exemplary early modern female, were the snail and the turtle because neither of them ever left their homes and neither made any noise. <laughs> so, so again, one motive for kind of muzzling women was economic. Uh, it, it prevented competition uh, and, and disabled encroachment on the increasingly lucrative uh, uh, domains of learning and professional services. Uh, Aphra Bain, uh, was the, who, who was the first English woman to earn a living by writing, was condemned as a whore uh, for her work, and Lady Mary Roth, who was one of Shakespeare's contemporaries, was called both a whore and a monstrous hermaphrodite for publishing her prose. So uh, this is interesting to me, this equating of women's speech with their sexuality, and it's spectacularly enacted in Elizabeth Carey's The Tragedy of Miriam, which is the first uh, English play outside of translations known to be published by a woman. Uh, it was printed in 1613, and the play is about Queen Miriam and her tyrannical husband Herod, who is obsessed with her fidelity to him and extremely threatened by her tendency to talk. Uh, not just to other people, but to men, and, uh, and in public. So when the play begins, uh, Herod is out of town, and, and rumors are rampant that he's been killed. 
there's a, there's a lot of confusion about you know the political condition of the country and about what the repercussions of his death might be for various characters in the play. And amidst all this confusion and instability, Miriam remains doggedly chaste, but alarmingly talkative. Uh, it, in the course of the play, it becomes clear that these two conditions, chastity and speech in a woman, are mutually exclusive. Uh, as Carrie's chorus points out, Miriam's only transgression is her insistence on speaking, but that crime is tantamount to promiscuity. Uh, to talk with anyone other than her husband, and especially to have a public voice, uh, is to commit adultery. So, so here's the chorus, and remember the chorus, you know, the convention of the chorus is that it represents uh, the elders of the community, conventional wisdom. So, so here's the chorus. Um, Tis not enough for one that is a wife to keep her spotless from an act of ill but from suspicion she should free her life and bear herself with power as well as will. That, that, that wife, her hand against her fame doth rear that more than to her lord alone will give a private word to any second ear. Yet though most chaste, she doth her glory blot. When to their husbands they themselves do bind, their thoughts no more can be their own and therefore should to none but one be known. Then she usurps another's right that seeks to be by public language graced. And though her thoughts reflect with purest light, her mind, if not peculiar, is not chaste. For in a wife, it is no worse to find a common body than a common mind. So this conflation of discourse with intercourse is put more succinctly by Herod, who unfortunately hasn't been assassinated after all, and, and he puts Miriam to death when he returns and finds that she's been talking to other males. So what he says is, and this is just stunning, uh, she's unchaste, her mouth will ope to any stranger's ear. So Herod's kind of dizzying and bizarre equating of orifices here links uh, un unruly female tongues to unruly female bodies. Um, and his, his wife's crime of speech is compounded, alas, uh, by her extraordinary beauty and by the fact that uh, she seems to be so virtuous and chaste. He's, he's, he's enraged by the belief that uh, her ideal appearance conceals a, a corrupt interiority, her outside deceives. And um, so in, in the society, the society of the play and also Shakespeare's society, Elizabeth Carey's society, society that's plagued by rumor and confusion and problems of evidence and therefore of judgment, um, this perceived disjunction between a woman's interiority and her external appearance, again, becomes dim emblematic of all, all disorder and it must be eradicated. So Miriam is decapitated, which is a, an especially fitting death because it safely distances her tongue from the rest of her body. <laughs> um, so uh, early modern culture, as you know, as does ours, in fact, drew significantly on ideas inherited from classical and biblical traditions when, when theorizing about uh, men and women's nature. And Aristotle, of course, was, was one of the most influential of classical philosophers. Uh, he, he taught that women were inferior to men in every way, morally and intellectually and physically and spiritually. Uh, and in his work on the generation of animals, Aristotle observes that, that, that a woman is just less fully developed than a man. Um, uh, it beca it's because of a constitutional lack of heat that she's both incomplete and imperfect. And his, her insatiable sexual appetite, he explains, is caused by a physiological desire for completion by intercourse with the male. Both Galen and, and Aristotle argue that uh, embryos are uh, originally all, originally conceived as males, but that if the mother's innate defect is, gets transmitted to the baby, then it's no longer perfect and a female child uh, results. Um, so this was, this was, you know, the truth about the hydraulics of reproduction for, for, for a long, long time. The physical infirmity that, that distinguishes femininity, uh, of course, is closely related to the, the moral and intellectual deficiencies of women. Um, Plato's uh, Timaeus suggests that 
women incarnate the souls of men who in a previous life behaved in a dissolute or debauched manner. So constructing the feminine the, from this kind of mixture of churlish metaphysics and, and androcentric science and what Milton would condemn as sin-bred morality was really effective. Uh, the titanic discourses of Western civilization, philosophy, science, religion, could not be wrong. Uh, and, and in Shakespeare's culture, <clears throat> women's physiological differences were medicalized, uh, not only as infirmities, but as evidence of a treacherous and dangerous disposition. Albertus Magnus's massive work, entitled on the, translated as On the Secrets of Women, warns that female bodies drain men of power and even of life. Uh, they are the source of mutability and corruption, and they tempt men to waste themselves. So here's Albertus Magnus. Too much ejaculation dries out the body because the sperm has the power of humidifying and heating. But when warmth and moisture are drawn out of the body, the system is weakened and death follows. That is why men who copulate too much and too often do not live long, for bodies drained of their natural humidity dry out, and the dryness causes death. One of, one of Shakespeare's contemporaries on display uh, here in Special Collections is Edmund Spencer, whose epic poem, The Fairy Queen, draws on this discourse of, of, of predatory females, a sort of um, succubus that sucks the very life uh, out of men. Um, his, he, his unquenchable Argante uh, kidnaps knights from fairyland and makes them her sex slaves. And as you can imagine, when you uh, see this passage, Spencer makes Spellcheck go haywire. Uh, but but here, here's an account of the insatiable Argante. But over all the country she did range to seek young men to quench her flaming thirst and feed her fancy with delightful change. Whomso she fittest finds to serve her lust and be the vassal of her pleasures vile. And similarly, uh, Spencer's Amazon queen, Radigund, emasculates and dispossesses her, her male victims. She literally carries them off the battlefield and imprison them. She imprisons them in, in closed domestic spaces in her castle. She compels them to dress up in little maids' outfits with white aprons, and, uh, and she breaks their manly swords and forces them into domestic labor, spinning and carding and weaving the, the surplus value of a quintessentially women's work in, in the period. And so Spencer's narrator kind of interrupts this sordid tale of degradation with some kind of metacritical uh, moralizing that brings him to the brink of treason. Because remember who's queen uh, when this is published. And here's what he says. Such is the cruelty of womankind when they have shaken off the shamefast band with which wise nature did them strongly bind to bay the hests of man's well-ruling hand that then all rule and reason they withstand to purchase a licentious liberty. But virtuous women wisely understand that they were born to base humility, unless the heavens them lift to lawful sovereignty. Uh, so it, you know, if, if the Amazon queen's uh, power over her male subjects is unnatural and ungodly, uh, and if womankind must be tethered to man's well-ruling hand in order to prevent her disposition uh, to licentious liberty, then what is the reader to think of the reigning Queen Elizabeth I? And, and if not for that kind of Hail Mary uh, pass in the final line, the, the, the stanza really does uh, savor of, of sedition. But, but the author escapes with his life by adding that a woman's role can be legitimate if God himself exalts her. In addition to uh, the works of Aristotle and Galen and Plato and other ancient writers, uh, the Bible, uh, both the, the Hebrew Bible and the Christian scriptures, greatly influenced thinking about women. Uh, and that said, it is important to note that the books of the Bible, whether Old Testament or New Testament, uh, they don't have only one thing to say about women. Uh, they're, they're very polyvocal texts written over the course of you know, more than a thousand years, and they represent a variety of 
theories about, about women. But early modern writers who wanted to subjugate women found ample support in the Bible. Uh, the most frequently quoted passages uh, regarding women came from the New Testament letters of Paul. So in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul ordains a very strict hierarchy in which women are both inferior and, and subjected to men. So uh, referring to the story of, sorry, I'm exfoliating. Um, restoring to, uh, referring to the, the story of Adam's creation from, uh, from earth, from, uh, from dirt, uh, and Eve's from his rib, the, the, uh, the, the passage argues that <clears throat> the head of every woman is the man. A man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Boy, never underestimate the importance of a preposition, right? Um, <laughs> early, early modern conduct books uh, frequently reiterated this argument that the prior creation of man demonstrated his precedence, his superiority over women, not just uh, spiritually and intellectually, but also morally and physically. Uh, so St. Paul's epistle continues. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, the first uh, pastoral epistle of, Ti uh, of Timothy kind of hammers home this flowchart of power. Um, it exhorts females to adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if she continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Phew. Um, so <laughs> those in power during the Renaissance used biblical passages like this to, to enforce the, the, the subjection of women in, in every sphere. And the Bible, of course, was the ultimate authority. I mean, if you had God on your side, you won, or you were <laughs> annihilated. But it was the ultimate authority. And, uh, and interpretations of uh, its teaching could actually be even more oppressive than the text itself. Uh, Martin Luther, for example, inferred from the anatomical difference of males and females a moral significance. Here's Martin Luther. God has created man with a broad chest, not broad hips, so that in that part of him, he can be wise. But that part out of which filth comes is small. In a woman, this is reversed. That is why she has much filth and little wisdom. <laughs> The, the French philosopher and reformer John Calvin was a particularly severe commentator on women. His discussions of the fall uh, in Genesis emphasize Eve's guilt and, and the blame and iniquity uh, that all women have inherited from her originary wickedness. And, and as a result of this first female's crime, all women must suffer greater subjection than men. If a wife does not submit to her husband, Calvin insists, she's blaspheming against God. So. Here's Calvin. Uh, when wives contend or argue with their husbands, it is the same as if they would reject God. Women must needs stoop and understand that the ruin and confusion of all mankind came in from their side, <laughs> and that through them we be all forlorn and accursed and banished from the kingdom of heaven. When women do understand that all this came of Eve and of the womankind, as Paul telleth, in another, uh, telleth us in another place, there is none other way but for them to stoop and to bear patiently the subjection that God hath laid upon them, which is nothing else but a warning to them to keep themselves lowly and mild. So given the pervasive injunctions against women's independence and speech, uh, moral authority, erotic will, uh, and mobility of any kind, uh, uh, Shakespeare's Desdemona has got to be one of his most threatening heroines. 
not only does she violate uh, every early modern taboo related to race, class, and property when she elopes with the Moorish soldier Othello, but she petitions the Venetian Senate's war council in the middle of the night to let her accompany her self-chosen husband into a war zone. Uh, she says to them, uh, that I did love the more to live with him. My downright violence and storm of fortunes may trumpet to the world. The candor with which Desdemona publicly acknowledges that her attraction to Othello is both emotional and physical is shocking uh, by the standards of Shakespeare's culture. And lethally for her, um, she's actually the only person in the play who isn't completely wrapped around the axle about sexuality. Um, according to the long-standing um, Christian tradition of condemning sexual pleasure as a mortal sin, even within marriage, Desdemona's frank desire is especially disturbing. St. Jerome, St. Augustine, Calvin, and other pillars of the uh, Christian tradition warned that to enjoy intercourse with one's spouse is to commit adultery. Uh, Nicholas of Alcimo declares, the conjugal act may be without sin, but only if in the performance of this act there is no enjoyment or pleasure. <laughs> and St. Augustine kind of elaborates on this precept. There are four motives for conjugal intercourse to conceive offspring, to render the marital debt to one's partner so that he or she might avoid incontinency, to avoid fornication oneself, and to satisfy desire. The first two motives are without sin and excuse intercourse. The third is a venial sin. The fourth, to satisfy desire, is mortal. Uh, St. Jerome, not a girl's best friend, uh, St. Jerome is particularly anxious, though, that men, too, um, refrain from sexual pleasure. He says, an adulterer is he who is too ardent a lover of his wife. All love of another's wife is shameful, so, too, too much love of our own. A wise man ought to love his wife with judgment, not affection. Let him control his impulses and not be born headlong into copulation. Nothing is fouler than to love a wife like an adulteress. Let them show themselves to their wives not as lovers, but as husbands. And John Calvin concurs. The man who shows no modesty or comeliness in conjugal intercourse is committing adultery with his wife. Those who undertake intercourse for pleasure exclude God from their minds, act as brute beasts, lack reason, and if they begin marriage for this reason, are given over to the power of the devil. So well steeped in this cultural brew uh, that prescribes, uh, proscribes women's independence and will and sexual pleasure, Desdemona's father, uh, Brabantio, is scandalized by her betrayal. He describes her behavior not just as a personal grievance, but uh, as a kind of atrocity that threatens the basis of patriarchal social order. He says, <clears throat> mine's not an idle cause. The Duke himself, or any of my brothers of the state, cannot but feel this wrong as toward their own. For if such actions may have passage free, bond slaves and pagans shall our statesmen be. So of course Desdemona has to die. Uh, but in the course of the play, uh, Shakespeare has exposed the violence that informs many sacred cultural institutions and practices, including the law, the family, religion, marriage, racism, and the doctrine of chastity. Throughout his works, he discloses the motives and methods of power and makes us uneasy with our complicity in them. His landscapes are crowded with women marauding around as if they had a will independent of fathers and brothers and the state. Um, and those female characters, like Shakespeare's female contemporaries, were situated at the epicenter of seismic social change and ferocious resistance to change. So while Special Collections has little evidence of his historical female contemporaries, there is on display abundant documentation of the anxieties that inform their culture's representations of them. Thank you.